Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Anne. Well, I'm really excited to be here today and to, to see everyone. Um, I'll just share a little bit about why I'm passionate about this work and maybe a little bit of my experience that might give you all some, some opportunity to gain some insights along the way. Um, I've been very fortunate to work within nonprofits early on in my career. Um, I share that because I understand how they think. I understand what they want. So think about your grantees and, and what your expectations are, but what their hopes and aspirations might be. I also worked for about a decade in a corporation um, that started as family owned. So was very much part of the evolution of the company's philanthropy unique to the family founders philanthropic intentions. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, and now at William Blair, I have the honor of working with about 50 families, many of whom are like you, um, through which they are, they're prioritizing exactly what Anne summarized. Um, what are the best practices? How do we engage the next generation? And how can we ensure that we're having a meaningful and lasting impact with our philanthropy? So as Anne mentioned, I have a deck, uh, but this is really your time. I really appreciate what the Loyola Family Business Center does, which is, um, well, you know, of course you're recording, this is confidential and the anonymity that stays in this space is very important because we get to both learn from each other, but we get to share some questions and perhaps some experiences um, that we wouldn't normally be able to share. So with that, uh, Anne and I have been working on this for, for quite some time, but I also think that it's really timely. Uh, if you think about, if you just kind of take a step back and think about the landscape of wealth itself, um, we are amongst a great wealth transfer. Um, if, if, if you've probably read some of the statistics, uh, a lot of different academic institutions and financial services firms have put out them. Um, but, you know, as, as, as much as $70 trillion will be exchanging hands into the next generation in the forthcoming decade. Um, you know, when you think about philanthropy, we're going to talk today a lot about its purpose and alignment to values and the mission of your families. Um, but we, there are a lot of significant considerations when you think about the allocation of capital uh, through that wealth transfer and what happens um, in the tax landscape, estate landscape um, and multi-generational wealth creation mm -hmm. standpoint. Um, so I just wanna acknowledge that because you know, there's a lot of motivations to give um, and, and while you're giving effectively, uh, a lot of our roles include being good fiduciary stewards of your family's capital. Um, the last bullet on this slide is one that I'm personally passionate about. I guess you could say I'm a bit of a, a second generation philanthropist myself, but um, millennials tend to be charity minded. Um, you know, 84% of millennials have made charitable donations which is pretty astounding. And if you think about social media's role and how easy it's become to donate to someone's, you know, Facebook birthday fundraiser or give to a cause episodically when there's uh, a global disaster, it's really not surprising. Um, but 70% of millennials have given more than an hour of their time uh, to volunteer for their favorite ch for their favorite charities, which we'll talk a little bit about today and why that's why that's special. So again, just in summary, it's very timely to be thinking about this. And I'm sure there's other instances that make this timely for you too, whether that's um, maybe an exchange of responsibilities at your family business, uh, liquidity, et cetera. Those are all instances that, that we work really closely with families on um, and, the, and the role of philanthropy in that. So as Anne mentioned, whether you are new in this journey or refreshing where you're at in this journey, uh, this is just outline what the benefits are from a multi-generational approach and, and why it's important. And we can use multi-generational interchangeably. Uh, I'll be honest, some families have next generation bloodline who are very interested in philanthropy um, and some don't. So we're going to talk a little bit about time horizons later. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about roles later. 
I'm using the word multi-generational as both family, um, as well as just who is the next generation of leadership who will be running or could be running your philanthropic entities. Um, it is pretty, again, timely though. Uh, nearly 60% of family foundations have started to engage younger family members in their foundation. Uh, not necessarily on boards, perhaps, but as advisors, um, as, as participants in the family's philanthropy, and more than 40% say they expect to add or increase the number of generation family members on their boards in the near future. And the governance piece is pretty important. So we'll talk about that today, too, as a best practice. But what does this really do? I mean, I would say half of the families that I work with are using philanthropy both as a tool to invest in their communities, but also to create ties amongst generations of family members that if a patriarch or matriarch um, or a generation has, has now passed the baton, it is a really beautiful way to keep the family together, especially if there's some family members involved in the family business and some aren't. Um, many, you know, next generation members are at different phases and stages, but philanthropy really can be that tie that binds. Um, what we find is for a lot of families who have foundations, this is a really exciting way to learn about new critical issues and discover new ideas. Um, I think there's a statistic in here, but up to 70% of the next generation might view the first generation's perspective on issues as a little bit different than their own. How do you weave that in and build something cohesive? I actually have a, a case study. Um, it might be a little simpler than we think, um, but as you all know, you don't wanna have 12 different funding areas. You wanna have some specificity around your philanthropy that will allow you the ability to really make a difference. Um, it's always a good time to refresh your governance. We'll talk about why. Um, and I think now more than ever, it's important to revisit and lock in your legacy. Um, we have a lot of families right now who are simply writing letters to their next generation and talking about why their family even started to be philanthropic in the first place. And I've got a little bit of an expert excerpt um, I'll share later. But let's kind of take it back to like the motivation to give, because uh, sometimes we lose that. Sometimes we kind of start with, okay, I'm going to give money away. Laura, tell me how to do that and have the biggest impact. But there's actually like a hierarchy of values that we all express um, that makes philanthropy a bit of an intuitive quest, I would say. Has anyone heard of the Barrett model before? Okay, I'll send some follow-up on that, but it's basically, um, it is based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and this is a place that we start a lot of times before we even get into philanthropy. What is our motivation to give? Why are we giving? And if you think about this ladder almost at the bottom, um, it's like just basic safety and ensuring stability all the way to the top, which is living your purpose. Nine times out of 10, you're going to find yourself um, within the five, six, and seven rung, where families are looking to express their authenticity, help communities, and live out their purpose through philanthropy. I'm happy to go into this in more detail. Um, we've created uh, different surveys that families use to, to identify kind of where they're at in this hierarchy. Um, and I shared this particular one today because a lot of companies actually use this too. Um, and sometimes it is either a coincidence, an intention, or a distinction that your family's philanthropy either complements um, or doesn't the culture of your business. But, but this piece has both the corporate and company and business perspective, as well as the, the family cultural motivations to give. So I highly uh, recommend you looking into the Barrett model. So what are the priorities for engagement? And again, we're looking at this as you might already have established charitable vehicles. You might just be simply refreshing them or it might be time to bring the next generation on board. Um, it is always a good best practice to clarify your intent. So again, what is that purpose of your philanthropic capital? 
I always tell our clients, it's okay if you don't know, but let's try to get as close to the intent as possible. If it is post liquidity or pre liquidity, and we're simply trying to maximize the tax efficiency of an event, that's okay. But let's dig in on that a little bit. What do you want to see this become in three to five years? What are the issues and areas that you care about, even if it's just one or two? Um, I mentioned this, but sharing and documenting your legacy is so important. And the reason I find it to be really important is because regardless of whether or not you have different perspectives or views on the world or different causes than your children, nieces, or nephews, or the next generation might have, there is an innate, going back to that, Barrett, there is an, an innate respect uh, for those who came before us and who kind of chartered the path of philanthropy. Um, it's interesting. I'm working with a family right now whose G3 want nothing to do with philanthropy. They really, they really feel that um, as an inheritance that, that they would like to differentiate from. But the more we dug into, let's talk about this. Like, why did your grandparents start this foundation? They started to really become more interested um, they didn't know a lot about their grandparents' business. Um, they didn't realize that a lot of the reasons their family was funding libraries across the country was that before their grandmother met their grandfather, she was a librarian and one of the first female librarians in the Midwest. So documenting your legacy might sound a little bit like, okay, yes, we've got, we've got that on the shelf. We've made the video. We've done it. But put it in the context of philanthropy and why it's important. Um, I think it's important to prioritize your motives and your strengths. Uh, we'll talk about that. Prioritizing your issue areas um, and forming your family identity. And that's kind of, that's the beauty of this all is, is most of the families I work with don't necessarily have a mission statement on a website for their foundation, but they have a very strong family mission statement. And honestly, I think that's, that's way more important than having a mission statement on a website. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the how here, because that was probably a lovely little trajectory. Um, but what are some of the ingredients around the best practices of family foundations? Um, I find this to be a pretty easy uh, diagram or a pretty easy uh, um, pyramid, if you will. Um, there's kind of three areas that, that we recommend you dive into and have a roadmap around. The first are those principles that we just talked about. So what's your family mission? What are your visions? What are your values? What are your policies? How do you get people engaged? Who's going to communicate? What are the rules? What's the expectation for participation? We get a lot of questions for G2 and G3 when it's like, hey, you know what? I have no time to do this. But here's what I'm really interested in. It's okay for people to have different levels of participation or interest in the family's philanthropic work. Um, practices to get them on paper and follow them. We are all, you are all very, very busy, you know, but are you going to meet once a year? Um, are you going to have advisors along with you? Are you going to have an education program? What are kind of the practices or kind of the nuts and bolts of all of this and what do you need? And we'll talk about a little bit, we'll talk about that a little bit more through the lens of strategy, but then also some resources too. So not trying to simplify it, but these are, these are very good foundational best practices for putting the process together. Laura, just a point of order. I think your bracelet or something is, pick, we're picking up a lot oh. of news from your bracelet. Is that better? I think so, thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. No worries. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about the roles. This is really fun. Um, I do this with families uh, quite often where we're talking about or refreshing what the different roles are in your family's philanthropy. Organizers. Who's going to set the meetings, make the agendas, distribute the notes, kind of at the bottom of that period, that pyramid that we just saw. Um, researchers, who's going to research nonprofits and funding opportunities? I'm working with a family right now who they have um, a lot of their next generation kind of in that capacity of researchers. 
but they're also researching who are their current grantees are because a lot of uh, families might be getting into a cycle where they fund the same nonprofits year over year to enroll some researchers within the next generation or with some fresh perspective is a really good idea. Um, who are the volunteers? Who are the boots on the ground? I know that COVID has made it extremely challenging to work side by side with nonprofits, but a lot of families actually um, require uh, volunteering as part of their grant making, or at least some kind of interaction and experience with potential grantees. And again, not everyone has the time for it, but if you have a few people doing it, it's going to bring you a lot of confidence in your process. Um, who are the networkers? Some family members just might be more predisposed and, and have a broader network. Maybe they're already engaged philanthropically in some different groups. Uh, maybe they attend a lot of charity events, but having those networkers are key internal um, eyes and ears into what's happening in your communities. Um, evaluators, <laughs> every family has good evaluators. Um, considering what impact philanthropy is having, if the goals are being met, I think you can probably all attest to one of the biggest challenges in philanthropy is too many good ideas, or how do we align this to what we said we wanna do, does it fit in? having a couple of really good evaluators is going to help you. Um, I always tell families, like, think about the velvet hammer. It's not easy to say no. If you're clear and you've got some good evaluators on your team, it's actually not a no, your project isn't going to work. It's a no, this isn't necessarily a fit for us right now. Um, decision makers, you know, we look for that, obviously, from a board composition perspective, but just also those who will help with that. Um, and visionaries. Who's gonna lay out the big picture vision and make sure that philanthropy is both operational as well as aspirational? That is a constant balance that we're trying to achieve. Laura, I would imagine that in some foundations, you'll have multiple family members wearing two or three more of these hats. So you're really yeah. just talking about clarifying who's doing what. And then if something's missing, if you have a skills gap, you want to make sure that you're thinking about that around recruiting people to work on the foundation with you. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll literally sit down and plot people's names in these spheres um, to see where there are opportunities or gaps. And people really take those roles seriously. So one uh, great opportunity that we see with some families is that as they're looking to build engagement from the next generation, and they also are looking for service opportunities and development of the next generation, they may pull them onto the foundation. Um, but if we're working with assessments, we might actually be able to identify who some of these people are in the next generation and pull them in or invite them in because of the skills that we're missing. That's a great point. Okay. I've got a couple of questions uh, yep. from somebody that I just want to read. So um, there's some curiosity about how many people on the webinar um, already have millennial family members engaged with their foundations. And, you know, if you just want to use your um, reaction button by putting up uh, thumbs up uh, in, your, uh, in your picture, that would be really helpful. And then the other question is the source of donations to the foundation. Um, is that coming from millennials um, or the younger generation in some families? And you could use the chat to answer if you choose or however you want to do it. And I'm happy to share my perspective there too. Please do. Let's hear. I think with the source, the source of the funding is very rarely coming from the next generation. Um, now, what I will say is a lot of families are using, you know, whether again, it's, it's kind of um, a wealth planning exercise or some type of liquidity event or tax planning event, you know, um, what we usually find is families are also trying to consider at the same time how to bring the next generation into the broader landscape of understanding the family's wealth. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of our families kind of say, well, why, Laura, can we, can, like, can we start with philanthropy, meaning, you know, 
sometimes the the kids have no idea, you know, what the wealth is or what the revenues of the business are. They might be very involved, but they almost use the foundation as a way to start building some financial engagement and acumen um, amongst the the kids. Um, and I've got a slide with like some budgets and whatnot in here. But if you think about it, like if it's a, let's just say it's a $10 million foundation um, and your children are getting involved, like there's the grant making, but we also call something the other 95%, which is beyond the 5% minimum distribution requirement. How is that 95% being managed? What's your time horizon? What kind of performance do you want to see that portfolio make in order for you to support your philanthropy? Uh, so a lot of families, the, the funding isn't coming from the next generation, but they're using the corpus of the foundation as a way to teach millennials about wealth and wealth management. Okay, that's great. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about just high impact philanthropy and, and kind of finding your focus. Um, my catchphrase is, you know, people kind of tend to go straight to like, what's our mission statement? We talked about that a little bit earlier. What's, what's my mission? What, you know, I look at mission statements from other foundations. Let's see what they have to say. My recommendation is you take a step back. What problem are you trying to solve? You know, so if you think about education, is it, I care about education or is there a problem within the education system that you're trying to address? With the environment, think about something that's so broad and over, like somewhat overwhelming to think about how you fund and align. Within environmental sustainability, what problem are you trying to solve? If you don't know, that's okay. Um, you know, one, one area that we help a lot of our clients with is conducting landscape analyses. So you can go out there and kind of say, hey, you know, I care about education, but like, here's, here's what, here's what, here's what keeps me up at night. Here's a problem that I'm seeing. The next step would be who's doing what, right? And what, what, what could philanthropy do to play a role in solving this problem? Um, there's one example that I'll use because I worked at the Alzheimer's Association, but there was a lack of Alzheimer's funding uh, for Alzheimer's research. And that in and of itself is very broad. So you can say, okay, we should advocate, we should be involved in policy to get more funding from NIH to researchers. But when you dig, when you dug on it, what was really happening is that researchers were leaving the field of Alzheimer's because they weren't getting the NIH funding. And what they needed was bridge funding. They needed 50,000 to 100,000 to just research enough to publish a report and then once, once they were published, the floodgates opened and the NIH funding was there. So it was less of a problem of the money that was flowing into Alzheimer's research. The problem was really the lack of researchers. So I kind of share that because it, it gets really interesting. And I think it's a, it's a great idea to, to kind of refine and go back to your focus areas and ask yourself, you know, not just what our mission is, not just what our focus areas are, but what problems are we trying to solve? And I think this is kind of interesting to see what other family foundations are looking at. Um, education gets the highest percentage of philanthropic dollars, about 29%. Health is up there too, followed by arts, culture, and I was surprised to see sports. Um, but if you think about organizations, I'm sure like urban initiatives, sometimes sports organizations are uh, dually supporting perhaps both both the sport and the youth development component. Is that helpful? Just kind of thinking about the, the giving areas. Uh, I'll just ask a question. Um, it, are people focused on the problems they're trying to solve? Are they clear? And is it shared across the foundation and across the broader family? You can use the chat to answer if you wish. While you share, I will share that one of the biggest challenges we see is, okay, wow, we, we started supporting these causes because that's maybe what grandma and grandpa or mom and dad cared about. Um, how does it fit in now? How does that, how do those issue areas fit into what we're doing today? 
Um, and, and we'll talk about that a bit in the budgeting um, and working with a family that's grappling with that right now. Um, and they actually created a, a legacy giving bucket of funding where they said, hey, you know, some of these organizations and organ some of these organizations we really care about, we don't want to lose touch with them. They've been so meaningful to our family over the years, but they're not going to make up the majority of our philanthropy. But let's give it some time. Let's put, you know, maybe 5% or 10% of our funding kind of in this legacy bucket to fund those organizations while we either maybe step down. Um, or maybe we'll find out something about those organizations, something they're doing that might lend to our refreshed focus areas. And you'd be surprised um, it might, what might work and, and what might not. But that's really been the biggest challenge, I think, is like, you know, we talked about respecting and, and looking at the legacy, but, you know, with that comes a lot of legacy organizations that have been supported over time through the Family Foundation. And how do you reconcile that? Uh, with future causes. I don't see anything. Uh, let's see here. You have one person uh, sometimes solving a specific problem, but not always. Okay. So this is a, I just wanted to maybe show how some of this comes to life. Um, you know, what we started with working with a family about a year ago, um, we, we did the hierarchy of motivations, um, their number one, and there's no right or wrong answer. That's the beauty about philanthropy. Their number one motivation was building relationships. They were really worried that the uh, kind of three pods, they call themselves, of the G2, the G3s were going to lose touch. They live all over the country. They've got different kids at different ages and different stages, like their number one motivation were building relationships. And I love the, the, the calls because we had a big grant that their first big grant making cycle was at the end of the year. Um, and, and we said, well, what, what did you find most fulfilling about that? And, and they all said, it was just so good to see each other. <laughs> and I thought, okay, <laughs> but it was a really, a really important next step for that family. Um, they want to courageously evolve. This family is in a family business that is evolving. Their industry is evolving. Um, their family business might even be obsolete in the next 50 years. So they wanted to use philanthropy as a way to be courageous. Um, you know, it, it might sound strange, but I tell people, don't put all your eggs in the foundation basket. Use that basket, you know, to go find more cultivation opportunities. You can use your foundation to test and incubate ideas that you might not yet even know are on the horizon. And their third was cultivating communities. So like actually helping people and helping organizations was actually their third motivation. Um, and then living their purpose was the fourth. So I, I share this just, you know, in all honesty, that, that motivations are very personal. And again, like you're not gonna go out and tell the entire world, like our number one priority of our family foundation is to build relationships amongst each other. But if that's what's important, we're gonna build a structure that really accomplishes that for you. And of course you're gonna accomplish everything else. Um, I put on the right here, like this was just an excerpt of a letter that the G3, uh, G2s wrote to the G3s where they were talking about their family. And then at the bottom, um, you know, they had gone through those roles and they came back and they looked at the focus areas and it, they, they honestly, they had uh, probably 18 <laughs> different focus areas. And I said, okay, let's distill them as much as we possibly can. Um, they were really hesitant. You know, there's kind of a rule of thumb, um, three to four. And if there's more than three to four, it's going to be really hard to have an impact. So they would not let me go below eight. And I said, okay, let's pretend you have eight focus areas. Let's just go see what happens when your researchers go out and your volunteers go out and you have your first funding meeting. Um, and I'm happy to report <laughs> that they did distill it down to four. <laughs> um, and this can change, right? But this is actually, these were actually the grants uh, and the organizations they came back to share with each other. They, they did all kind of fall within four versus eight of the focus areas that they wanted to prioritize. And at the end of the day, I mean, people can have personal passions, um, but when you think about the foundation as an operating unit, these are shared, right? 
these were their, their values that they also distilled that at every meeting they start with, they ask themselves, are we striving for efficiency and excellence? Are we operating with passion, urgency, transparency, trust, humility, and cohesion? Are we seeking wisdom? Are we promoting dignity? And are we, are we optimizing our time, talent, treasure, and testimony? So this is a true North. That's, that's it. That, that's, uh, again, not a fancy website, not, not fancy guidelines, but something that they work with and their, their family to accomplish their goals. So hopefully, hopefully that's helpful. I wanted to share something real. Um, this was kind of the budgeting portion of it. Uh, I have to be honest, um, sometimes with, with multi-generational engagement, there's a lot of questions of, well, how much money do we get to give away? And we said, well, let's talk about that after. Let's talk about that you know, at the end versus the beginning. Um, so I thought that was kind of an interesting approach to it. We made it, we did make it work for everyone. This family's particular goal is they started, they started at a certain level. They're gonna go up year over year. Uh, they wanted to start with something meaningful, but not too much for people to bite off. So let's bring that back a little bit to just high impact philanthropy on a whole. Uh, there were a couple questions leading up to today. And Daryl, Kevin, and Daryl. Whoops. That's okay. At least it's not my bracelet. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that's okay now. We're good. Um, we have a little bit of a, I was sharing with Anne, we have a little bit of a, um, a decision tree, if you will, for how to, to vet and review grants. I'm happy to share that. Um, you know, a lot of times it's what are the ingredients of a, of a good proposal? This is a great education. We actually walk family members through this. Um, so they understand the tools and resources available. But some of the indicators we look at are, is the organization that's asking for a grant, is the mission aligned? Is the organization financials and the size of the grant request um, logical, uh, meaningful? Oh, Laura, use the example you talked to me about, about the family that wanted to make a donation to an organization that would have overwhelmed them. Yes. So a lot of times, I mean, even just looking at the organization's budget, looking at their 990s, this family was very motivated by a nonprofit organization. And they said, we're thinking about a donation of X amount. And it actually made a lot of sense. The amount made sense for them. It was a smaller grant uh, for them. But when I started doing research on the organization, the organization had never received a grant of that size. Uh, and it was probably, it was when I started looking into it, it was, it was really hard to understand, like, what would they even do with a grant of this size? How could they utilize it or scale it? So we hosted a call with the organization. They talked about their growth um, and, and the family ended up making a grant to the organization, but they made it over three years instead of one lump sum. So the organization could think about how they would scale their programming with a support. I always tell people, if you look at an organization's operating budget, you should not consider a grant more than 10%. Like that, that's an enormous donation to an organization and 10% even of itself would deem a very special circumstance in my opinion. So kind of understanding that piece of it is, is always good when you're looking at a grant because you're always compelled by the mission and the cause first, but to get into the financials a little bit is to, and to your point, it's, it's going to be mutually beneficial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other thing is just looking at the organization's financials themselves, like what percentage of their budget is going to their programs versus their operations. You know, we kind of go by the 75, 25 rule, um, but, but really good information out there on public free nonprofit websites like Charity Navigator, where you can educate yourself a little bit on the financial components of your potential grantees. I look for organizations to have on their website published annual reports with some strong stated metrics and progress, I would say nine out of 10 organizations have something on their website. And if they don't, it's not necessarily a don't fund, but I would definitely inquire on how they're communicating their impact. Um, I look at things like, you know, on their events page, and again, we know with COVID, there's not a lot of in-person events, but is their website up to date? Are they, are they sharing information in a timely fashion? Um, what is their board and uh, CEO leadership composition? 
if you think about what the mission of the organization is, do their board members, can you kind of look at their affiliations and get a sense for, huh, okay, I can see why these board members are on the board and, and what, what talents or skills or expertise they're applying to this organization to help them succeed. I always look at the executive director's bio to see what their skill sets are that they bring the organization. Um, and the last one, brand and reputation might feel a little bit squishy, but I always take a peek at um, the organization's presence externally. Uh, is there positive press? There are lots of organizations like Glassdoor that will talk about their workplace and uh, what it's like to, to work at that nonprofit. Um, the final one might sound simple, but like, what is their responsiveness? If you reach out and have an inquiry, you know, are they responding to you in a, in a timely fashion? So again, I've got this more in like a checklist or there's even portions of it that are if you rate it on a scale of one to 10 and it helps to deduce or possibly even create a tool for reviewing grants. And I'm, I'm happy to share that. But this is, it's an important piece of, of high impact philanthropy. Any questions? Um, this is a good question. What experience do you have with trust-based philanthropy? How does the example of potentially overwhelming a too large a gift square off with the approach? This is not trust as, a, as in financial trust. This is trust as in trusting people to do the right thing. And then uh, Monica has a link here that she embedded in the chat. Yes, I love talking about trust-based philanthropy. Um, it, it was a perfect segue to the next slide. Um, <laughs> Gold star, Monica. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of buzzwords, like, you know, I'll be honest. Uh, trust-based philanthropy, philanthropy, moonshot philanthropy, we'll talk a little bit about each of those. I think, you know, to me, what trust, place-based philanthropy, I didn't even put that one on here, but, um, you know, are you place-based? Do you care about your community? Do you care about an issue at large? A lot of families' portfolios include both. Um, many, I would say a trend is moving a little bit more towards place-based. But trust-based philanthropy, there's a, probably a few different interpretations of what that means. At its very core, this term resurfaced during COVID uh, when there was a big push for philanthropists to give unrestricted support to organizations. Um, now, if you kind of connect the dots, right? Like a lot of nonprofits, um, were eligible for the PPP loans. Part of that was making sure that they kept their staff on during COVID, which was very important. Organizations desperately need general operating support as much as they need programmatic support. In the past, the higher amounts of philanthropy, uh, there was a correlation between that and restricted program support. So if you think about it, what was happening was the most sophisticated um, highest philanthropic foundations were restricting their support to programs that weren't necessarily paying for the organization to run itself. So I share those two little bits of, I think, important insights because there's very good reasons why trust-based philanthropy came back to the forefront. But when I think about trust-based philanthropy, I think about capacity building. Um, and those are the questions I ask nonprofits when I have a client who's thinking about trust-based philanthropy. It's not just writing a huge check and say, hey, go forth, good luck. We don't need a report. I do not believe that that's what trust-based philanthropy is. Trust-based philanthropy, I think, is really saying, tell us about what your vision is for your organization, what the capacity building infrastructure you need is to accomplish it, and we are more than happy to support it. We'd love to check in every year and see how things are going. Um, what the field is also trying to doing, trying to do, and I think very, it's very good, is, is stripping nonprofits from doing 10,000 different reports for 10,000 different grantees. Mm -hmm. um, so Monica, I hope that's helpful because I don't think there's a, a super defined definition of trust-based philanthropy, but just that's my opinion of, 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 of what it is and where I've seen clients approach it in really strategic ways. There's another question about um, giving based on grants or grants, you know, uh, RFPs or RFQs. I, does, in general, um, some foundations who are further along the pipeline accept grant applications. Newer foundations, younger foundations might uh, 
keep it under their hat and not want to be overwhelmed with a request for funding. So can you talk a little bit about that, about the move toward a request for um, grant applications? Yeah, I would say a lot of foundations have the LOI kind of step where there's a letter of inquiry in between a proposal. Mm -hmm. um, I like that step because I don't like to see nonprofits put together big fancy proposals if it really isn't something that's going to be funded. Mm -hmm. um, that's an interesting approach, right? Like if you're new, you probably need a lot of more, you need more ideas. So do you, do you, do you want more proposals at the beginning so you can see what's out there? Or like go back to that role. Do you want seekers who are going out to find? Um, I would say most of the families I work with do a combination. So it's not just based upon the tenure of the foundation. In fact, I'm working with a family right now who they're refreshing a focus area. They said, okay, we've been funding this for 20 years and it's been by request only. Mm -hmm. um, we need to open this up. So they're actually opening up one of their giving areas for RFPs and they weren't before. Our recommendation is they kind of, they, they're kind of pitching that more as like a prize um, where it's like, hey, like they're going to be a little bit more public and say, we're looking for the next new idea. Or we're looking for great ideas, not just a, here's an RFP and we'll give you a grant, mm -hmm. um, you know, because they really are searching. Like they're really looking at how they can solve this particular problem. And they just got into this pattern of like, okay, here's the 15 organizations we fund in this funding area year over year. It was getting a little bit stale. So it could be used maybe to refresh. Um, but I have found the open kind of LOI process a little more helpful in the beginning. And then it's a refresh as those focus areas evolve. Okay. Thank you. And part of that is budget oriented too, right? So if you think about like this piece, what, what are your time horizons? There is a bit of a trend for foundations where they're starting to think less about perpetuity and more about a time horizon, maybe to see an impact in their lifetime. Um, so I share that because we do a lot of forecasting with foundations. If you also think about impact investing as a trend, I work with um, a family right now who 10% of their foundation uh, budget is actually coming back to them because they're doing more program related investments and micro lending. Um, so they actually have income as a, re as a result of their philanthropy. And they're like, whoa, like we thought we were going to shut this down in like 30 years. Like this wasn't a foundation we were going to have in perpetuity, but now, now we're getting income back um, from these program related investments and, and recoverable grant structures that we're putting together. And now it looks like we might have more money than we thought we would. So that, that time horizon, it can change, but again, just an important consideration. Like if this is something that you're building in perpetuity and you're going to manage a bit to that 5% minimum distribution requirement, because that's kind of what the earnings might, you know, project for you, you might not want to go totally open with every focus areas to get a bunch of RFPs. Because what will ultimately happen is you're going to have more opportunity than assets, if that is your goal. But if your goal is to have a defined perhaps time horizon for your foundation, having more ideas, granting more than the 5% um, and, and seeking uh, is, is going to be, is going to play an important part. So that was another good segue actually. Um, budgeting for impact. I'll, I'll briefly touch on this. We talked a little bit about that before you saw the slide where um, there was an example of actually doing some budgeting. Um, Budgeting for innovation, give yourself a little wiggle room to try new things. I just mentioned impact investing. We have a lot of families who are now seeing returns on their philanthropy, um, bringing the next generation involved in things like the spending policy um, and whatnot. Uh, disaster relief is becoming more and more common. We're seeing more foundations putting some money aside so they can be episodic here and there when it, you know, it deems important. We're work, working with a lot of clients this week uh, who have family members who are impacted um, in what's happening in Europe. And, and you know, they're, they're making some significant investments, um, but they, they, they kind of budgeted for that. They, they, they said, we want to have these resources available when we need it. And then finding the right vehicles. Honestly, this in and of itself could be a separate session, but I'm happy to talk through this. There's no one size fits all. We kind of coined this as, family foundations, but um, more and more families are using donor advised funds to perhaps get the next generation involved in philanthropy before the foundation. 
Donor advised funds are great sidecar companions to foundations. Even when we use the word foundation, that could be a trust, a private operating foundation, a private non-operating foundation, or a public charity. Um, and you might have heard about um, a lot of uh, families who are, are even looking at LLC structures um, as ways to, to give. So happy to talk more about this on or offline in the future, but, but these structures are important as you think about um, migrating. And, and we have families that, that switch, right? So we're a trust, but we're going to become a private operating foundation, or we're thinking about starting a donor advised fund as a sidecar to our foundation, Laura, what would that look like? How would those two vehicles work together? Um, and sometimes that's also a tax optimization strategy as well, but happy to happy to answer more questions there. There's uh, another question here. Can you talk more about microloan financing and philanthropic efforts? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, um, program related investments, mission, program impact investing is kind of this like universe, if you will. Mission related investing is when we're talking about your foundation assets. So if you're funding environmental causes, you should probably also invest in companies that have strong environmental tendencies, right? That's kind of the mission related investing. Program related investing microloans and recoverable grants are, are, are ways that you can use the out-the-door philanthropy um, to help support your mission. So for instance, uh, maybe you're focusing on immigration as a funding area and you set up a, a loan program for DREAMers. That loan program can actually be uh, recoverable through which students repay loans at the low market rate. Um, there is a lot of work in micro lending uh, to entrepreneurs through different nonprofits around the world, um, where a nonprofit will actually take a grant, uh, they will invest it into uh, micro um, entrepreneurship initiatives, o almost think about it as like seed or series A funding, and, and a portion of that might come back to you uh, in the form of a recoverable grant, um, or again, a below market loan structure. Um, if you're in the arts, we love art space. They actually invest in real estate for artists. And again, these are, you know, the, the, the goal isn't to provide free art space or free living for artists, but affordable living um, and affordable spaces for artists. So, so a portion of that grant uh, will come back into your foundation um, as a loan repayment for a recoverable grant. Right. Can you explain the tax deductibility limits for private foundations? On the inbound or the outbound? Um, I'm going to say both. Um, so donations into your foundation, obviously you get the deduction and then there's um, AGIs. Let me pop up something really quick. So, because we've got a whole piece for each foundation's donor advised funds and donations direct to charity. In 2021, the CARES Act extension of the deductions for charities halted. So let me pull that up so I don't misspeak. Um, and I'm just gonna pop this one up really quick too, Anne, which is mm -hmm. the um, records, yeah, rules and filings because I think this is an important one too. Um, so just give me a second. I'm gonna stop sharing and then pop up that deductibility piece. So while uh, Laura, uh, works in the background there to pull something up. I just uh, want to invite everybody. It's 11.53 and at 12 o'clock, or we can go a little over if you want, if Laura's not done, or if you have some more Q&A for her. Um, but the idea was to go into breakout rooms and answer just a couple of questions uh, and to share with one another. And those questions are essentially um, identifying where you are in your foundation stage of development and identifying what you do really well as a foundation and to do that in small group. Um, and then, you know, maybe share out some of your greatest challenges. And then finally, um, you know, if there is something that Loyola Family Business Center can do to provide more education like this to you, we'd love to be um, able to do that for you. So we'll do that a little bit after the hour. In the meantime, if anybody else has questions right now, you can either um, unmute and ask them and we'll pay attention. I see Laura's pulled up the document now. 
Yeah, so there's a few things, and I'm happy to share this too, but we put this together at the end of 2021. Um, the comparison charitable giving methods, which in and of itself, I think is really interesting what you can do with each vehicle. Um, and then the uh, deductibility of the cash gifts, there's cash, but then there's also deductibility, of course, of appreciated and long-term stock or real estate, um, et cetera. So ha happy to share this. Laura, uh, why don't you um, send that to me and I'll send it out to the group afterwards, okay? If yep. that's okay. Yeah. And for those who have, you know, privately held shares or um, real estate or other complex assets, all of that also plays a role. I don't think we got into too much of the complex assets in this particular piece, but yeah, I'll share it in so you can distribute it. Thank you so much. Um, so the inbound was actually the focus. Okay, perfect. So that should satisfy that. Yeah, great. Good. Um, do you want to go back to appendix records, rules, and filings? Oh, yes. The exciting stuff. Anything. Yes. No, I, <laughs> my favorite thing. Well, I can't tell you. I ask clients all the time. I said, do, do you know where your 1023 is or your bylaws? <laughs> You're just going to take a peek at them. And there's different things. Like if you have a scholarship program, there's actually something you have to, to file with the IRS that says you're going to have a scholarship program. So we, we like um, dotting I's and crossing T's. Mm -hmm. um, but these are kind of the, the permanent retention items for your foundation. Um, there's some things that you're supposed to keep for at least three years. And then obviously uh, your financial documents as well that you're required to file. Now, um, it's great because... The other kind of consideration here is if, if you have an accountant, hopefully they will do a lot of this for you. Um, you know, lawyers who form the articles of incorporation and draft your bylaws, advisors. We have a lot of foundations that ask, you know, we're giving a lot of grants away. It's, it's very laborious and paper driven. Do you have any ideas for what providers are out there, like a foundation source to help us streamline this? And then how do we pay for these services? Because your 5% minimum distribution requirement actually includes payments for services associated with your philanthropy. So if you have to hire um, a lawyer or if you need to pay your um, accountant or if you'd like to hire an advisor, you can use the foundation assets to do so. So the IRS will try to make that piece flexible, but they are going to want to make sure that you have all of these, these records on file and they're just really good to have. You know, Laura, sometimes in the evolution and development of these structures, you know, we use blended services, right? You know, the CFO, who's also really running a family office, who is also, you know, filing all the tax returns and stuff for the foundation and so on. How does that, is there like a best practice that we move to over time? I'm, I'm guessing it's anchored around the earlier slides where you talked about purpose and mission and legacy planning and whether or not you're going to be around in perpetuity. But could you just touch on that a little bit? Because I think many of the foundations that at least are part of family businesses have, they're either earlier stage or they're just not standalone operations. They're dependent um, on either the business or they're dependent on, um, you know, other professionals, right, to take care of some of those services. Yeah. And I think that's fine. Two things I would say is make sure you have like a quarterback, maybe one person who's keeping an eye just on the philanthropy piece. Mm -hmm. um, maybe check in every couple of years with a nonprofit attorney, in addition to maybe the family attorney or the estate attorney, just to make sure that, you know, again, all of these things are in, in, in good uh, accordance. I'm working with a family right now that set up um, uh, a membership governance structure for both their business and their foundation. So we're working with both their corporate attorney as well as a nonprofit attorney to make sure that both of the membership structures can be carried out within the business and the foundation. So I would just make I would just make sure that you know there there there's a kind of a coordinator or someone that's kind of pulling it together. It's okay if it's it's combined. I actually like seeing it a bit of of, of combined because then it's not whoops you know, we're doing all of this for the business, but we forgot about the foundation and some things do lapse. Um, but just make sure that there's some coordination. And, and every, we find it a good practice every two to three years, kind of a consultation with a nonprofit attorney in addition to your, your corporate or family attorney. 
And then I have another question. I hope everyone else, feel free to jump in, but I have a million questions for Laura. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, the move towards collaborating with other foundations, and you and I talked about this, you know, people have a um, altruistic purpose. There are things that they want to accomplish, but they feel like they're standing alone and they need to do it by themselves. Uh, what are the resources available to find out about how I might work with somebody else to and beyond the donor advice fund or an organization like that. Is there something like a matching service for other family foundations to collaborate for, you know, a common purpose? There are some great ones. Um, a lot of them are membership based organizations like Forefront in Illinois. We love the National Center for Family Philanthropy. We find them to be very um, innovative. Uh, the Center for Effective Philanthropy has a really interesting issues mapping um, initiative. Um, there's a lot of, uh, GEO is another great network. Um, depending upon where your philanthropic assets are, if you're a donor advised fund, they have giving kind of circles, if you will. The Chicago Community Trust obviously does. Um, family foundations also use the Council on foundations is a great source as well as exponent philanthropy. Mm. Um, all of those organizations have conferences and convenings and webinars, and I'm happy to put a list together of those two, if that would be helpful in some follow-up because the membership obviously would require a fee that you could pay from your mm -hmm. foundation, but, but even the webinars and uh, the learning experiences or the convenings could be very valuable too. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Well, it's 12 o'clock. Um, I'd like to open up the floor again and ask people to um, post their questions or you can unmute and ask the question if you have it for Laura right now. You have this access to all of this wisdom. Let's use it. I'm just looking in the chat too, and to see if yeah. I missed anything. Uh, let's see. Oh, um, I think Monica, you also mentioned too, sounds to me like the foundation is the one that should take the leg on the leg, should take on the leg work of vetting their recipients rather than the traditional model of having the recipients jump through a lot of hoops. Um, we are also seeing a lot of foundations kind of simplifying the grant application process mm -hmm. um, and making sure there's a, there's a common grant application that Forefront put out a lot of uh, state kind of put out that foundations can model. Um, and what I like about that is, is when, you, when you bring that into your methodology, it's, it's almost a given that that's what probably 80% of other foundations are requiring the nonprofits to provide. And that's called the common grant application. Nice, really nice. And uh, this is Greg, Greg hey, W. I, I do have a question. Mm -hmm. Um, we have, my wife and I have a uh, private non-operating foundation, and originally we thought it would be a good idea to bind our, our children together to do good, and, and then we have changed our mind, and we want to convert it to an operating private foundation uh, and dedicated to some conservation properties. And my question is, um, we're having all types of uh, hassles uh, with the IRS, uh, uh, sending our application back uh, to me rather than my attorney and closing it out, and, and then finding out that it was some technicality, then refiling. And we're, we're trying to get that one, I think it's form 1023 that was mentioned. We're trying to get that designation. And the latest we have is, is in six months they will assign somebody to look at it and and to me that's just a simple calculation of ratios and they issue a sheet of paper so uh, is it typical to have this much problems with the irs going from private non-operating to operating it's typical that the irs is uh not responsive um i have not seen it to be that difficult greg and i'm happy to talk about that offline but it is taking them a ridiculous amount of time right now to get to to anything it used to take maybe top six months for a conversion and i'm seeing it to be nine months to a year right now um yeah. 
I do have some clients that are opening up donor advised funds in the meantime as workarounds. Um, so they can still fund what they're wanting to fund, but the, you know, you, a, a private non-operating foundation can make a donation to a donor advised fund to meet its 5% minimum distribution requirement and then start to make donations out of the DAF instead of the foundation while they're waiting for that status to shift. So there could be a couple of workarounds too, but. Okay. So I would like to speak separately. I don't want to tie up the group, but, but, uh, you know, our rationale for going to operating is that, you know, we're putting in millions of dollars of real estate and we don't want to have to pay 5% of that to donations. So, yeah. So I'll, I'll speak with Ann separately. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, Greg. Great to hear from uh, you. Okay. Thank you. I'm still out there. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoying retirement, I hope. Yes. Okay. Well, and, and donor advised funds do not have a 5% minimum distribution requirement. And they obviously have different tax structures. So we'll, we'll weave that into the conversation. Good. Uh, anyone else? Okay. Um, Laura is going to stay with us when we go into um, our breakout rooms. So um, unless...